Well, hi, folks. My name is Stu Bamek, and I'm part of a ministry, Consequential Christianity. In Consequential Christianity, we're saying that uh, Christ, our faith, our belief, Christianity is so much more than just a spiritual enhancement to our lives or a good thing that nice people do uh, or the general uh, belief in the notion that God exists. But but it's consequential. It makes a difference in our lives. And, and we do some felt need series on how to overcome adversity. We do, we do some thinking series like our faith, our culture, our future. And we do some series uh, on the Bible studies. Uh, and I like to march through that uh, one verse, one word at a time. Here we're in Galatians. Why are we studying Galatians? Because Galatians is the clearest statement of the Christian faith that we find in the Bible. It is a consolidation of Romans. And Romans is a consolidation of the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You get Galatians and you'll get the Bible in six short chapters. It's called the Magna Carta of the Christian faith. And Luther, uh, in 1535, gave his great lectures that were then printed uh, and spread throughout uh, Germany on the book of Galatians. It's the clearest expression. S secondly, it gives us a close look at the early church. Uh, Paul wrote Galatians, uh, possibly as the earliest Christian document that we have, 10 to 15 years after the death of Jesus. <sighs> He had taken a journey up to Galatia. It was the first place that he went to. That's where he lived, up in uh, Cilicia, and came from the town of Tarsus. He was familiar with that area. It's the area of Asia Minor, of Turkey, and Paul went there. And when he returns, Paul writes these letters to the churches. He writes a letter to each church that he visits and, and found. So here we have him writing this letter uh, giving us a clear look at what's taking place in the early church. And, and third, it gives us a, a close look at, at the greatest mind of Christianity, and that's the Apostle Paul. As you'll recall, last week I mentioned that in, in last message that Paul had, had three names and one title. His first name was his Greek name, his Hellenistic name, Paulos. Uh, Paul was a Hellenist. He, he lived and grew up in Tarsus. Uh, he studied uh, great Greek philosophy, literature, music, theater. He was, he was well-versed in, in the Greek language, Hellenist, Elos, Greek, Greece. It comes from Greece. It was brought in by Philip of Macedonia and his son Alexander the Great. It's the great age from 600 to 300, the great, great age of Greek Hellenism. Uh, in the world at that time, and Paul was well schooled in that. And secondly, he had a Roman name. Uh, his Roman name was Paul Paulus, P A U L L U S, because Paul is a citizen of the Roman Empire. Now, this is a big deal to be a citizen of the Roman Empire. It gives, gives you access to language, to currency, to schools, to travel. You can go anywhere you want. Interestingly, Peter, James, John, all the original apostles, they couldn't get out of Galilee and Jerusalem. They couldn't. They didn't have the languages, they didn't have the learning, and certainly they didn't have the passports to move around. Only one person was responsible for the spread of the, of the early church throughout the Mediterranean world. One man and one man alone, and that was Paul. Here we find him as Paulus. He's calling attention to his Roman name. And I went into some length, uh, lengthy detail on how he got that Roman name in our, our last message. But thirdly, he has, he has a Hebrew name. Saul, he's named after the, the, the first king of Israel. He studies under the great Gamaliel. He's, he's the Hebrew of the Hebrews. He knows the oral law, the ceremonial laws, the written laws. He, he knows everything there is to know about Judaism. He's handpicked to persecute the, the Christian church. He persecuted the men. He threw women into prison. He stood uh, watching uh, 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 people lose their lives, give up their lives for, for Jesus. He was there at the stoning of Stephen. He was ruthless. He was a terrorist. He's not the kind of man that we wanted to be around. Yet God takes him, he prepares him, and God uses him. So, so Paul is uniquely qualified, unlike all the other apostles. Paul is uniquely qualified because he is a, a, a Greek mind, he has a Roman citizenship, and he is a leader of the Hebrew people. He's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Well, there's one other thing uh, that I wanted to talk about in the, these first two messages, and that is that he has three names, but he has one title. Remember, he opens Galatians by saying, Paulos Apostolos. Paulos Apostolos. Galatians 1 and 2 are the verses that we're looking at, at in this message. And his name, uh, uh, Paulos Apostolos, he uses the Greek word Paulos, 
apostolizes. He is an apostle. Now, well, what, what is an apostle? Well, well, Paul begins with the most powerful word that he can use, the word apostolos. He's in an angry mood. It's not some wonderful, nice greeting. He's saying, Paul, apostle. That says, says it all. So that begs the question, well, what, what, is, it, what is an apostle? Uh, well, apostles are different than Disciples, matheteos, disciples. Disciples are learners, they're followers, uh, they're disciples. But they have no authority and they have no power. They can't do the things that Jesus did and they can't do the things that the apostles were doing. Apostles are messengers. They have authority. They have power. They have the power of Jesus himself within them. The word uh, apostle comes from the Greek prefix uh, apo, uh, which, which means from, and stelos, which means sent, one who is sent. If I were a king and I wanted to send a message to your, you in your kingdom, and you're the king of that kingdom, I would get my apostolos, one who was sent, and I would give him a careful message, and he would take it and he would hand deliver it to you in the other kingdom as the king. And when he delivers that message, you are required to receive him as if he were me, the king himself. He has all the rights and status of the king. He's an apostolos. It's a, it's a very, very special, unique role for people in the early world. He is an ambassador. He is a, a diplomat carrying a unique, special message. And it's a message that he did not write himself, he did not compose it, he carries it, he delivers it, but it has the seal of the king with it. Now, that begs the question, how many apostles were there? Well, we find that there were the original 12, and then Judas took his life, and then Mat Matthias was, uh, 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 Matthias was called to take his place, and then when Matthias was called, we find this man by the name of Paul also making a claim for apostleship. So technically, the original 12 plus Matthias plus Paul himself. The office of apostle is the New Testament equivalent of the Old Testament prophet. Thus saith the Lord. They were gifted through a, a illumination of God's word to be God's spoke, spoken, chosen people. God expirated his word, he breathed it out. The prophets, the apostles, they breathe it in, they record it, and then it is illuminated to us, all of which is through a process that is carefully orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of revelation to us. Now, there were three qualifications for apostleship in the New Testament. One, they had to be directly called and commissioned by Jesus. Two, they had to have spent three full years of the public ministry of Jesus from his coming back from, from his uh, time in the wilderness and, and the uh, temptations by the devil. When he comes back in, he immediately calls these twelve. They're going to be with him for the three full years of the public ministry of Jesus up until his uh, resurrection and then his ascension so that they can validate that and they can say, I'm an eyewitness. I saw that take place. And the third thing is that they did have to be an eyewitness to the resurrected Jesus. They couldn't profess the resurrection of Jesus if they weren't there with the resurrected Jesus. You see, uh, God chooses these apostles to be his messengers, these, these ones who are sent, and their message is to be received as if it were Jesus himself speaking directly to you. We have a, a, a Reformation principle that says that Scripture interprets Scripture. Human beings don't interpret Scripture. We're not smart enough to do that. God interprets the Scripture. By that I mean that special revelation, the Word of God, interprets general revelation, God's revealing himself in the world, and the epistles interpret the gospels in the book of Acts. So we have scripture interpreting scripture. And, and, and so apostolic uh, revelation is a big deal. We live in an apostolic church. And, and that's important because with the end of the apostles, this kind of prophetic interpretation of scripture is now closed. There are no other 
apostles. There is no other word or revelation that is given that is to be incorporated into the canons of the Holy Scriptures. So when we hear uh, uh, Joseph Smith uh, uh, having these experiences with a, an angel or a messenger from God and he believes that they're a part of the Bible or Muhammad has his visions and he believes that they're a part of the Bible, none of that is really true. They can't. The apostolic church is closed. We are an apostolic church. There is no more revelation to be given to us. So how does Paul uh, meet these qualifications for apostleship? Well, he tells us in Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. He said, Paulos apostolos, Galatians 1, 1, sent not from men, nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Uh, you got to love this first verse. I mean, you just got to love this first verse. I'm not sent from men. Not some, The source of my authority is not some church council. It's not a group of people. There was no vote for me to be an apostle. There was no election. It wasn't some finite group of human beings. Nor I was not sent, sent not through man. Not through men, a group, but not through an individual human being, a bishop or a ruler or the leader of the church. No, none of them called me. I was not appointed and commissioned by people or by a person. I was not sent by them. Let me explain that to you a little bit. He writes in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 through uh, 21, these words. He, he writes, when he would set me apart, before I was born, uh, let me pause just for a second. God knows us before we're born. He knows who we are. He's going to hand craft us, hand shape us, hand make us, hand mold us. He knows us from before we're born. God had called him from before he was born and set him apart as one of his chosen, as one of his people. And he called me by his grace. He doesn't call me by my way, working my way into heaven as the Pharisees did and as I was trying to do under Gamaliel. No, he called me in grace at that great moment of conversion. And I can't wait to talk about that when we get to that passage here in Galatians. But he can, continues to say uh, that he, he, and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Now, now Peter's commission, the apostles' commission in Jerusalem was to speak to the Jews. There was only one person, as I've already mentioned, who was commissioned to speak to the Gentiles, who spread the word throughout the known world at that time. That's this man, Paul, right here. I, 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 I might preach him among the Gentiles. And when he did, I did not immediately consult with anyone, no one, anyone. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem where the church was, where Peter was, to those who were apostles before me, where the church council was, to the other apostles. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then in verse 18 of chapter 1, he writes, Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, that is Peter, and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother, and what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went in the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Paul's saying, when I had this conversion experience, you ask how I spent three years with Jesus in his public ministry. I spent three years with Jesus by myself. Three years. Then I went up to see Peter for 15 days. And only Peter and James, uh, the Lord's son, uh, Jesus had, had some brothers. He had a nice family. And, and so I talked with Peter. But, but, but Peter was not giving me the message. I'd already learned that from Jesus. Jesus was the one who imparted the message to me. So my guess is Paul is up there in Jerusalem. He's saying, now look at Peter. You guys are here in Jerusalem and you're trying to spread the word around here. But I'm going to take this thing up into Galatia, up into Asia Minor, into Turkey. I'm going to go over to Greece. I hope to get to Rome. So I want you to know what I'm doing. I'm not asking for your permission. I'm not asking to be appointed by you. I'm, I'm not asking that you select me or send me out. I'm telling you what I am going to do as an apostle. So he says, first of all, yeah, I was directly called and commissioned by Jesus on the road to Damascus. Probably a greater call and commission than you had as you were there with your empty nets one day and Jesus said, come and follow me. 
my conversion was was spectacular. It was a theophany. It was a real visit from God, unexpected. Uh, and then I spent those three years with Jesus uh, at being an eyewitness to the resurrected Jesus. So I was sent not from men, not from a man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. I love this. This begins to get us into an understanding of the Trinity. I was not sent by anybody but a direct commission from God himself. Jesus was appointed by the Father to call me through the working of the Holy Spirit. You know, we're a Trinitarian church. We believe in three persons in one being, the Father, the Creator, the Son, the Savior, the Holy Spirit, the Helper, the Provider, the Illuminator to us, the Revealer to us. They have, there are three beings that are in, in, in persons that are in full equality together. But there is a functional subordination. That is, the Son reminds us, Jesus reminds us over and over and over again that He does the will of the Father. And the Spirit does the will of the Son. There is an orderly progression of roles within the full equality of the Trinity. Uh, so Paul is getting this direct commission you see, from the Father, through the Son, by the working of the Holy Spirit. You know, when I became uh, a, a clergy uh, and was ordained to the priesthood in the Episcopal Church and, and, and now the Anglican Church, uh, we had two different ca two calls. You get an internal calling, that's a, a prompt things and leadings inside, but yet there needs to be that external calling from an ecclesiastical authority which calls us into the ministry. And, and there are generally certain uh, academic degrees that accompany that calling and, and pastoral training to satisfy certain requirements of councils and ecclesiastical authorities within the church. But Paul didn't need any of that. He's just telling Peter, I was called and sent by God the Father through Jesus Christ, through the miraculous activity of the Holy Spirit. Three years in Arabia, directly called and commissioned, eyewitness to the resurrection. Now, now, this concept of the resurrection, he does tag on here, who raised him from the dead? Uh, God raised Jesus from the dead. He tacks that on to this first verse here. He is an eyewitness to the resurrected Jesus. And when he saw him, his whole life changed. He understands that the resurrection is the central doctrine of the whole Christian faith. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 17, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. Your life is not changed. If Jesus isn't raised, as other translations say, it's nothing but foolishness to us. We're foolish. If we do this and believe this, and in some cases give our lives for this, and Jesus isn't raised, that would be foolish. The ultimate test of authority in Paul's mind is authority over death, is power over death. And Paul's amazing claim is this. If God raised Christ and gave Jesus absolute authority, and that one who has absolute authority demonstrated by the resurrection if that one then calls me and reveals to me his authority, then I have the authority of that one who has been raised from the dead. I have the power and I have the authority of the one who was raised from the dead. If Christ is not risen, my faith, my work, my life is futile. It's foolish. If he is not risen, I have no authority and you have no revelation. And then he closes this message by saying, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, of Turkey, of Asia Minor, where Cilicia is, and Tarsus, his hometown. So what do we have here? Well, we have this great Hellenist, this great Greek mind, who's a Roman citizen that can travel wherever he wants with enormous privileges and rights in the ancient world, who's a Hebrew of the Hebrews, who knows the Old Testament inside and out, who, who was rising up the, the ladder, being taught by Gamaliel. But when he had this conversion, and when he met Jesus Christ, this great giant, this man who was born to be great, 
in the Greek world, the Roman world, and in the Hebrew world, born to be great, became absolutely humbled by the Lordship of Jesus Christ in his life. He was brought to his knees by the riches of knowing Jesus Christ. And in that way, only Paul then was really prepared to spread the gospel to the known world. And he did change the language of Christianity from Aramaic and uh, really changed it to, to, to the Greek language so it could be spread throughout the world. He gave his life for his call, for his Lord, for you and me. I like to think of it this way. Paul was uncompromising. He, he never compromised his beliefs, his truth source, revealed word of God and calling of his inner core. He never took a step backward. He was beaten. He was stoned. He was imprisoned. Gave his life up in Rome. But he believed to the end. He finished the race. He was uncompromising. Yet, by being uncompromising, it doesn't mean unloving. It means uncompromising, therefore loving. I'm uncompromising in my faith, therefore I am uncompromising in my love. To Paul, he is never more loving than when he is loved and called by his Lord Jesus and willing to lay down his life for him and for us as well. So, as I asked you in the first message, where has God prepared you? What influences have you had on your life? People that God's brought your way? What, what places have you lived in? What have you learned? What do you know? Everybody's an expert at something. Something that you know. How's God prepared you to be used by him? And are you and I willing to allow him to be used? Help me to love you, be used by you, and be available to you every single day of my life. Now, this is important. We're living in this, this pandemic time. Uh, it, it's, it's an unnatural time. God did not create us to live this way. Uh, uh, this pandemic isolates us. It alienates us. It separates us. That's not the way God wants us to live. He created us as relational human beings. And when relationships don't work so right, life doesn't work so right. And, and, and in this virus kind of time, you know, we wear masks and we are interestingly, metaphorically, socially distanced. It's not the way God created us to live. He created us to live in relationship, in intimacy with him and with each other. As you've heard me say, that why are we here? Why did God create us? Because God loves relationship and he wants to have a relationship with you and with me. So where's God prepared you? And, and in this time of, of, of separation and isolation, how do you think that God might want to use you? What do you think he might want to do with you? And where do you think God's calling us to be uncompromising? In our truth, in what's revealed to us, and in our love. Where can we lay down our lives? And, 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 and maybe someday we're going to have to lay down our lives and be persecuted. I, I don't know. I did this series on our faith, our culture, and our future, and the rise of socialism and, and neoliberal Marxism in our country today. It's a very, very real existential threat, not only to who we are as a culture, but to our faith. I can tell you this. When, when the world turns secular or socialistic or neo-Marxist, which sooner or later it probably will, when our culture will do that, the first people to be persecuted, to be silenced, to be marginalized. The, the first people, as, as the Stasi used to say in, in, in Germany, behind the wall, that we're going to switch off are the believers, you and me. We live in the end of the age, the last of days. There's nothing else left to do in the whole history of salvation. Nothing left to do but the return of Jesus. Everything else is done. The sending of Christ, the living of a perfect life for three years, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension into heaven, the coronation of Jesus uh, in heaven, seated at the right hand of God the Father. The only thing else for him to do is stand from his chair, stand from his seat, his throne, 
and come back again and redeem those who love him. So where does God want us to be uncompromising in our truth? Consequential makes a difference. Our work, our lives, how we raise our kids, how we spend our money, what we do with our time. It's consequential. And where is God calling us to be uncompromising in our love for the people that God brings into our lives? God is a God who changes lives. You and I cannot come into contact with the true God of the Bible without our lives being changed. Abraham's life was changed. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph's life was changed. Moses, David, Jeremiah, Amos, Isaiah, Peter, Paul, Paul, the great conversion of Paul. I can't wait to get to that passage of his conversion. Those lives were changed. And they were changed in a way that was uncompromising in what they believed and in how they loved. And my challenge to you and me in this message is to be uncompromising. Be uncompromising, as was this man who was born to be great. Three names and one title. Paul, Hellenist, Roman, Hebrew, the believer.